Hello, friend, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network and the original Tudor History Podcast, podcasting Tudor England since 2009. I am your host, Heather Tesco. I'm so glad you're here with me. I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 225, I believe. Um, It's Love Month still. Love Month is still going on. And uh, we're talking about all things related to Valentine's and love and nerve and stuff like that. So today we are talking about royal mistresses. Just a quick note, members and patrons of this show get extra episodes. They've been getting extra Love Month episodes. They also get cool things like discounts at my merch shop. Depending on what level they're at, they get a free e-course. Last month, it was on the Wars of the Roses, uh, an audio course. This month, we're doing one on Henry VII and his rise and consolidation of power. And I want to say hi to the newest member of the YouTube channel, who is Beverly. Hello, Beverly. And to the newest patrons, Gretchen. Hi, Kristen. Hello, Kristen. And Lisa. Hello, Lisa. So if you would like to also get extra content, other cool things, depending on what level you're at, you get a free TutorCon streaming ticket, all kinds of cool stuff. You can go to englandcast.com slash Patreon. If you're listening to this on the regular feed and Patreon is easy for you, englandcast.com slash Patreon. Or if you're listening to this on YouTube, you can also just click join this channel and you can pick the level that's right for you and the perks that you want. Members also get author chats uh, once a month. And this month we are chatting with Janet Wertman, who is going to be talking at TutorCon about Douglas Howard who, of course, had a thing with Robert Dudley. So lots going on in my membership world. All right, my friends, let us get into it talking about royal mistresses. The Tudor period, of course, was marked by dramatic political, religious, and social transformations in England. Amidst the backdrop of royal intrigue and power struggles, societal norms dictated very strict codes of conduct regarding marriage, which was often more a matter of political alliance than personal choice. However, the private lives of monarchs often painted a different picture with extramarital relationships and the role of royal mistresses emerging as open secrets within the court. Royal mistresses, though not really ever recognized, wielded considerable influence behind the scenes, navigating a complex web of courtly politics and personal ambition. These women, often chosen for their beauty and wit, occupied a unique position, offering companionship and counsel to the king while operating within the constraints of a rigidly structured society. Their roles shrouded in both allure and controversy highlight the dichotomy between public duty and private desire, revealing the human side of monarchy and the intricacies of Tudor life. So let's talk about, to start with, the societal role of a mistress. Of course, within a society bound by stringent marital expectations and alliances, the personal affections of the monarch often found expression outside the sanctity of marriage giving rise to the pivotal yet unofficial role of the mistress. These women, ensconced within the inner circle of the monarchy, wielded a form of influence that, while subtle, had the potential to steer the course of political events and royal favor. The societal role of mistresses in the Tudor court was multifaceted. Ostensibly, they were companions to the king, chosen for their beauty, their charm, and their intellect. However, beneath this veneer of courtly romance lay a web of political maneuvering and influence. Mistresses often came from the noble families seeking to elevate their status and power within the court. Their intimate access to the king allowed them to act as intermediaries for their families and factions, lobbying for positions, titles, and influence. The political sway of these women was not to be underestimated. 
their proximity to the monarch afforded them a unique vantage point from which they could sway the king's opinions and desires. This influence could manifest in various forms, from the promotion of certain political alliances and causes to the shaping of royal patronage. The arts, too, often flourished under their indirect patronage as kings sought to bestow gifts and favors upon their favored companions, thereby enhancing the cultural landscape of the court. Historical accounts and letters from the period hint at the intricate relationships between mistresses and the wielding of power. For example, the influence of Anne Boleyn, initially Henry VIII's mistress before becoming his queen, was instrumental in the advancement of the Protestant Reformation. Her ability to shape the king's religious and political views underscored the significant, albeit indirect, power these women could wield. Moreover, the role of mistresses could also extend to the realm of diplomacy and international relations. Through their connections and influence, they could become de facto ambassadors, involved in the delicate negotiations and exchanges that defined the political landscape of the time. So, the mistresses of the Tudor court were far more than mere romantic interests of the monarch. They were pivotal figures who navigated the intricacies of power, politics, and societal expectations. Their influence was often wielded from the shadows, and it had the capacity to alter the course of history, making them indispensable players in the narrative of Tudor England. So let's start with Henry VIII's most famous mistress, Bessie Blunt, Elizabeth Blunt. Her liaison with Henry stands as one of the most notable examples of a royal mistress's influence on Tudor politics, particularly because the birth of their son, Henry Fitzroy, who was publicly acknowledged by the king. This relationship not only highlights the personal dynamics within the Tudor court, but also underscores the significant impact these connections could have on the political landscape and the monarchy's succession plans. Bessie Blunt came to the Tudor court as a maid of honor to Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's first queen. Renowned for her beauty and her vivacious spirit, Bessie quickly caught the eye of the young king. The affair between Henry and Bessie, though not unique in the context of royal liaisons, took on a significant political dimension with the birth of their son in 1519. In an unprecedented move, Henry acknowledged Fitzroy as his own bestowing upon him titles and honors, including the Dukedom of Richmond and Somerset. This public acknowledgement was not merely a personal gesture, but also a political act that reverberated through the corridors of power in Tudor England. The significance of Fitzroy's acknowledgement lay in the context of Henry VIII's growing desperation for a male heir. His marriage to Catherine of Aragon had failed to produce a surviving son, leading to anxieties about the succession. Fitzroy's existence, therefore, presented a potential solution to the dynastic crisis. The fact that Henry VIII could father a healthy male child alleviated personal doubts about his fertility and shifted the succession's uncertainty onto Catherine's inability to bear a child. Bessie Blunt's relationship with Henry VIII and the birth of Fitzroy had far-reaching implications for Tudor politics. It emboldened Henry's quest for a male heir, contributing to his decision to seek an annulment from Catherine of Aragon, a move that would lead to the English Reformation and the establishment of the Church of England. The existence of a male, illegitimate child also posed a complex challenge to the legitimacy of any future heirs and raised the specter of a political succession dispute should the king fail to produce a legitimate male successor. Also, Bessie's status and influence at court during her relationship with Henry highlight the precarious nature of royal favor and the potential for personal relationships to intersect with and influence state affairs. Her eventual marriage to Gilbert Talboys, a knight of modest means after the affair had cooled, reflects the typical trajectory of royal mistresses who fell out of favor but were still provided for because of their past services to the crown, as it were. Bessie's story is a poignant reminder of the complex interplay between personal relationships 
and the machinations of power within the Tudor court. Now let's talk about the other Boleyn girl, right? Mary Boleyn, often overshadowed by her sister Anne's dramatic rise and fall. Mary played her own significant role in the court's intricate web of relationships and political maneuvering. Known colloquially as the other Boleyn girl, Mary's affair with Henry predates the king's infamous obsession with Anne and sets the stage for the Boleyn family's ascendancy within the English court. Mary's relationship with Henry began sometime in the early 1520s while she served as a lady-in-waiting to Queen Catherine of Aragon. The affair was relatively short-lived and, by most accounts, not particularly deep in emotional attachment, at least from Henry's side. However, it was significant enough for Henry to later acknowledge, notably when he sought dispensation from the Pope to marry Anne Boleyn on the grounds that he had previously been intimate with her sister. The implications of Mary's affair with the king were multifaceted. On a personal level, it introduced the Boleyn family to the innermost circle of Tudor power, granting them a level of influence and access that they had not previously enjoyed. Thomas Boleyn, the patriarch of the family, capitalized on his daughter's relationship with the king, maneuvering to elevate the family's status and secure key positions at court. The Boleyn's rise was meteoric, facilitated by the king's favor and the astute political strategies employed by the family, particularly Thomas and Anne. Mary's affair also set a precedent within the Boleyn family for forming advantageous relationships with the king, a strategy that Anne would later employ to far greater effect and with far-reaching consequences. While Mary was eventually married off to William Carey, a gentleman of the king's privy chamber, in 1520, the connection to Henry had already served its purpose, entrenching the Boleyns within the upper echelons of courtly power. The relationship had broader implications for the Tudor court's dynamics and the unfolding of historical events. The Boleyns' rise contributed to the shifting alliances and power struggles that characterized Henry's reign. Anne's subsequent relationship with Henry, undoubtedly influenced by her sister's earlier affair, led to the English Reformation and the establishment of the Church of England fundamentally altering the religious and political landscape of the country. Also, Mary's story raises questions about agency and autonomy of women at the Tudor court. Like many women of her time, her personal relationships were leveraged for familial gain, leaving her with little control over her own destiny. Her later life, after being widowed and marrying for love against her family's wishes, reflects the limited options available to women who fell out of favor or sought to defy societal expectations. Looking at this relationship, it becomes evident that Mary's story is not just a footnote to her sister's more famous narrative. Instead, it provides insights into the court's complex interplay of personal desires, political ambitions, and the way power works. Mary's relationship with the king was a catalyst for the Boleyn family's rise and a precursor to the monumental events that would reshape Tudor England. Now we're going to move over to France and talk about Diane de Poitiers and Henry II of France. She wasn't a Tudor mistress, of course, but she was the celebrated mistress of Henry II, exemplifying the profound influence a royal mistress could wield within the courts of Renaissance Europe paralleling the experiences of her Tudor contemporaries across the English Channel. Her liaison with Henry II, though occurring outside of England, offers valuable insights into the universal role and impact of mistresses in the political and cultural spheres of the time. Diane's relationship with Henry began when she was a widow in her 30s, and he was still a young prince. Their bond strengthened as Henry ascended to the throne and Diane, nearly 20 years his senior, became his most trusted confidant and advisor. Unlike many royal mistresses who were often chosen from the nobility or courtiers for their youth and beauty, Diane's influence over Henry was rooted in her intelligence, her political acumen, and the deep emotional connection she shared with the king. Diane de Poitiers' political influence in the French court was substantial. She was involved in state affairs to an extent unusual for women of her time, advising the king on matters ranging from foreign policy to domestic governance. Her involvement in the decision-making process was acknowledged and often resented by contemporaries, 
marking her as a formidable figure behind the throne. Diane's influence extended to the appointment of ministers and the distribution of royal favors, shaping the political landscape of Henry's reign. Her impact wasn't just limited to the political arena. She was also a significant patron of the arts, contributing to the flourishing of the French Renaissance. Her sophisticated taste and appreciation for beauty influenced the architectural and artistic developments of the period. The Chateau de Chenin, so gifted to her by Henry II, is a testament to her lasting impact on French culture and heritage. Under her guidance, the Chateau became a center of arts and intellectual gatherings, embodying the elegance and refinement of the Renaissance. Diane's relationship with Henry also had personal dimensions that affected the dynamics of the French court. Her rivalry with Catherine de' Medici, Henry's queen, added a layer of intrigue and complexity to the court's social fabric, influencing the courtier's allegiances and the royal family's internal relations. In drawing parallels with Tudor mistresses, Diane de Poitiers' story underscores the potential of royal mistresses to transcend their traditional roles and exert significant influence over the affairs of state and culture. Like her Tudor counterpart, Diane navigated the intricacies of court life with adeptness, leveraging her intimate position to become a key political actor and cultural patron. Now we're going to talk about the ambiguity of mistressship, the role of the royal mistress in the Tudor period, and indeed throughout much of European history, occupied a nebulous space between formal and informal power structures, navigating a complex interplay of personal intimacy and political influence. These women, often omitted from the official narratives of history, wielded significant sway within the courts. Their roles defined as much by their personal relationships with the monarchs as by their ability to affect policy and court dynamics discreetly. The ambiguity of mistresship lay in the inherent tension between the public and private spheres of power. Officially, these women held no formal titles or positions that would grant them direct influence over state affairs, yet their intimate access to the monarch provided them with a unique conduit to power allowing them to shape decisions, influence appointments, and even sway the direction of foreign and domestic policy. This informal influence was often exercised through subtle means, whispered conversations in the privacy of the royal chambers, the gentle persuasion of a confidant, or the strategic relay of information from allies within the court. One illustrative example of a lesser-known mistress who navigated these gray areas with considerable acumen was Mad Shelton, rumored to have been a mistress of Henry during his marriage to Anne Boleyn. Madge's influence, though not as overt or well-documented as Anne's, is a reminder of the quieter, more discreet ways in which a mistress could wield power. Her presence at court and her potential role in the complex web of politics highlights how these women operated within the shadows, leveraging their proximity to the king to advance their interests or those of their families. Similarly, the stories of Catherine Willoughby and Anne Bassett, though less prominent in the historical record, underscore the subtleties of mistresship. Catherine Willoughby, Duchess of Suffolk, was a close confidant and friend of Henry VIII, and was even rumored at one point to be his mistress. In fact, there's, you know, the recent books talking about how she would have been his potential seventh wife had he lived, all of that. Her influence at court was marked by her staunch Protestant beliefs which she used to advocate for religious reform, demonstrating how mistresses could engage in the political and religious debates of their time. Anne Bassett's involvement with Henry, while not conclusively proven, offers another glimpse into the discreet ways mistresses could navigate court politics. She was a lady-in-waiting to several of Henry's queens, and her position allowed her to remain a constant figure at court, providing her with opportunities to influence the king and his circle. These stories highlight the fluidity and complexity of the mistress's role within the Tudor court. Operating outside of formal power, these women crafted their niches, influencing the course of events through a combination of personal charm, strategic alliances, and subtle manipulation of courtly dynamics. Over time, the narratives of these mistresses have fluctuated between romanticization and vilification, 
remembered in some instances for their alleged manipulations and in others for their contributions to the arts and charity. Literature and media have played significant roles in shaping the public perception of these women, often casting them in the roles of seductress or victims of the king's whims. Works such as Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall and the numerous adaptations of the story of Anne Boleyn and her sister Mary have brought these figures to the forefront of popular culture, albeit with varying degrees of historical accuracy. Yet beyond the dramatizations, the legacy of Tudor mistresses is one of nuanced influence. Their ability to navigate the waters of court politics, to assert their agency in a male-dominated world, and to leave their mark on the historical record speaks to their resourcefulness and resilience. So my friends, we will leave it there for today. I will be back again next week. In the meantime, remember you can get lots of extra content, author chats, discounts to my merch shop, all kinds of fun stuff by joining the podcast at at patreon.com slash Englandcast or clicking join this channel now if you are listening to this on YouTube. Thank you so much, my friends, for being with me today. And I will be back again very soon. Have a fantastic week. Bye-bye. Blow northern wind, a sandful baby sweating. Blow northern wind.